Lab and the Creative Activism Series the institute, and the Institute's ongoing work with political artists and activists from the Americas. Our mission is to promote and strengthen critical reflection about the tactics and strategies of political movements, movements as well as the multiple processes and models of analysis through which these are arrived at. So thank you. This is our last day of talks, and thanks for being with us. At the end, please help yourself to the food in the back. There's so much. Thanks. And now, Jacques Servin. Hi. <laughs> um, thanks for coming on this beautiful Friday. Um, this is Ramesh Srinivasan. He's going to uh, tell you about his work. He's, uh, I think he represents the best in, in academic work and design work. He's like very thoughtfully figuring out how to make his work useful and how to actually uh, make it a force for change and empowerment rather than all the other things it can be, which are also sometimes very good. Um, but he's going to tell you a lot more details of that. Thank and you so, so much. All right, thank you all for having me. Um, there aren't too many people here, so I would love to uh, have this be really casual and conversational um, so I can learn as much from you, which is very likely I'll learn even more from you than perhaps you may from me. Um, but so, uh, you know, at any time while I'm sort of introducing my work, um, I would invite you to, um, to interject with clarifying questions or questions. If they're more detailed, we might do them at the end if they're more conceptual. Um, and it's such an honor to be here. I'm a big fan of the Hemispheric Institute. I'm a big fan of Diana Taylor's. Mary's been a wonderful uh, colleague of mine in our collaborations, in our conversation so far. And the Yes Men are my heroes. So, you know, so this is all a great, this is a great moment for me. Please come in. Welcome. Hi. Okay. So what do we got here? What is this an image of? Let me just start with that. That's a question I'll ask. It says it on the bottom right. I'll, if you did, if you, if you, and that's 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 the right answer. Um, and, and and what 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 I think is what we have here is this is a sort of image that is increasingly um, circulating as we talk about the internet. Um, this is an image that I believe is notable for its lack of materiality. What is this? Is this a set of galaxies? Is this a set of neural networks? Is this uh, an example of um, how one tries to draw, draw cells in the body or cells in some sort of network? Um, this way of describing the internet or the world of new media technologies is increasingly circulating. Um, this is a particular discourse that emerges out of um, Silicon Valley cyber culture today. Um, and I want to ask you all to think about what is sort of um, what is sort of contributed and constructed as we look at images such as these, and what is lost as a you know in that transaction as we think about this? Um, of course, the more common way of talking about the internet, internet and new media technologies today is the cloud, right? So again, just like cells in a network or galaxies or neurons in the brain, the cloud is something that um, we associate in a sort of positive and neutral and uncritical kind of fashion, right? So clouds are everywhere. They're ubiquitous. They're more ubiquitous in some places than others. Um, clouds provide water. Clouds are part of our life. There's a sort of naturalized category by which we understand technology and the internet that is associated with these types of images that are being circulated. <coughs> However, what we do know is that every construction of technology is actually a social construction of technology. And of course, technology is not simply defined as sort of the digital computational devices that we see around us today, particularly in um, the Western world and the elite parts of today's world. Um, but technology is any sort of construction that emerges out of human agency, culture, values, and so on. So the question for me is what is absent when we sort of think about metaphors like the cloud, when we think about sort of naturalized metaphors that we have to have nothing but an uncritical positive reaction to, like the galaxies. Wow, the galaxies. Wow, the cloud, right? What is disguised in that transaction are the actors that construct these metaphors. Not just the actors that construct these metaphors, but the actors that, constru that construct the technological apparatuses that form these networks, that form these sorts of metaphors. So specifically, two of our favorites are here, right? 
These are both organizations that are multifaceted, multiple actors, different agencies, different sort of stories associated with them, different ways in which we can ascribe and think about values and practices and behaviors and notions of agency that are associated with each of these actors. Um, so that notion of neutrality is actually a false notion. And that notion of neutrality is also built in with particular types of discourses, right? We must give to the cloud so it can give to us. Um, Kevin Kelly, um, the founder of Wired Magazine, one of the founding editors of Wired Magazine, um, in his TED Talk, which was uh, titled The Next 5,000 Days of the Web, said, we require and we desire total personalization. And for total personalization to come into our lives, we must give up total transparency. So that might be perhaps a Faustian contract, uh, but it's a discursive arrangement that is actually part of the discourse associated with the cloud, right? So this is something that we need to think about. What are the sort of implicit values and protocols that are built into these constructions of technology? And why are they so ethereal? And why are they so removed from human actors and human practices, places, peoples, infrastructures? These are all the metaphors that I try to contest in my work. So occasionally, we do see certain actors associated with the globalization of new technology, right? So 6 billion people approximately in the world with some type of mobile phone in their hands. Um, 3 to 4 billion people. These are different estimates with some sort of notion of internet access out of the 7 billion people that are in today's world. We see certain actors. But what's notable about these actors is not necessarily what they are doing with these technologies, but the fact that they have technology that they have mobile phones. So something in that process of having access to technology is actually, is actually generating this sort of beneficial, neutralized understanding of what technology is, or what it can be, or what it is for the world today. Right? So you know, we see an, an Indian holy man on the right hand side with a giant mobile phone and a spliff in his other hand. And we see an Indian fisherman. I'm Indian, so these are Indian examples. An Indian fisherman also with a mobile phone, right? So what's much more interesting to me is what are these people using these technologies for? And how are those uses and practices perhaps deviating from the types of notions that are built into the instrumentalization of access, the cloud, the galaxies, and so on and so forth? We see a few other images that are associated with the spread of technology. Um, here we have a smiling group of uh, beautiful South Asian women um, who are very happy because they're working in a call center in Bangalore in southern India. And on the right hand side we have a Maasai warrior who's now being benefited because he has access to micro labor, to outsourced digitally contributed labor. These are both images that were circulated by the organization SamaSource, which is a, um, a new media social enterprise organization that I studied and kind of critically took apart <laughs> in some of my writing. And what this, what this organization does is it actually outsources labor to people, targeted populations in different parts of the world. It's part of a process of globalization that is based on its isomorphic nature. It's unequally distributed. It's what Arjuna Padurai has described as a disjuncture, a disjuncture in the flows of information dating back to the late 1980s. So what's happening here? People have very simple tasks that they want to put online. Those tasks are routed to SamaSource, which is an NGO startup that's based in the Mission District. And then SamaSource targetedly routes those tasks to particular populations that will benefit through their access to this labor. In a very interesting twist on all of this, many of these people are working in forms of labor to actually assist algorithms in their own forms of labor. This is what Jonathan Zittrain calls artificial, artificial intelligence. So what am I talking about here? Well, we haven't really developed computational systems that do a great job of doing image recognition. That's just been a struggle for computer scientists. But we're pretty good at recognizing images as long as we can see. So what these women are doing is actually recognizing and identifying images so that computational algorithms can benefit from their labor. Right? So this is a very interesting and uncanny chain of networks that are happening here. So that's one way of kind of deconstructing these individuals as participants in a digital network. But another way of deconstructing who they are and what they do is to look at their sleep cycles. Right? So many people in the developing world, in the global south, 
um, are awake um, while uh, people in the other part of the world are asleep, right? So like they are awake while others in their nation are asleep. So what do I mean by that? When we call a call center, all of us have this experience, we often speak to someone who's either in Manila in the Philippines, perhaps in South Asia, perhaps in other parts of the world. So these are targeted labor tasks. But because they are often awake while we are awake, they are awake at a time when it is night in their own country. So how does that change the nature of place? How does that change the nature of materiality? How does that change the nature of infrastructure? How does that change urbanization? How does that change the relationships that traditional cultures have with their families and their values associated with this? So these are all part of the process of injecting what I call materiality into our study of networks. A much more deeper rooted understanding of people and populations on the ground that in a sort of seemingly neutral sense are benefiting from their engagement with technology. Another way of looking at that story is to critically unpack people's place-based contextual experiences on the ground. This is the ethnographic turn that a lot of my work takes. And I'm going to talk about some of my work more specifically in this talk in a few minutes. Now, how are these tasks being targeted to these laborers? Well, one of the main technologies that's being used for this targeting is called Amazon's Mechanical Turk. Um, how many of you have heard of Mechanical Turk? So over half of you. Um, Mechanical Turk is actually a reference to a chess playing automaton that was used by the, the aristocracy in, um, in Austria and other places where the aristocrat would actually play chess against a machine that would play chess against him or her. Now how was an automaton like this built? Well it turns out there was a miniature Turk underneath the machine and it was a double magnetized sort of machine. So the Turk would actually, who happened to be a chess master, would actually play chess against the aristocrat. Right? So what's happening here? This is a reference to the invisibility of labor. Right? The invisibility of labor and even the term the orientalization of labor. Right? The term orient in these, in these areas often referred to the Turkish part of the world. Right? The Ottoman part of the world. So there are these historical references that are actually being conjured up. Again, as we rematerialize our understanding of what technology is. So this is all very important because this is a world right now where we have lots of prophecies and lots of sort of armchair based statements about technology and what it means, but they are promoted by people with particular values and particular discourses and they're circulated widely. But a much more contextual look on the ground tells a different story. Here's one example of such a look. Does so anybody want to guess what this might be? Luckily, the answer is not on this slide. Huh? No. Oh. <laughs> Great eyesight in this room. That's right. So these, these, are, these are actually the underwater fiber optic cables that are actually constructing the very infrastructures of the internet that exist today. And what's notable here, again, is the sort of asymmetry of how these are being constructed, right? So there's only one major cable, for example, connecting Brazil to West Africa. And really only one major internet cable connecting these parts of the world. So our discussion, again, of the geographies of networks is unequally distributed when we actually look at places and contexts. And in this case, we look underneath the ocean. So already we've looked at chess playing automata. We've looked at people's fMRI cycles, their sleep cycles in South Asia. Um, and we've looked at you know, fiber optic cables. So these are all ways of rematerializing technology. And here's another. Um, this is an image of internet access. Now this is a problematic image because it's obviously confounded by where people actually live, right? So, but at the same time, even if you control for where people live in the world, you can see that there's a very unequal distribution of what internet access is, right? And you see sort of spaces, for example, in East Asia, Western Europe, North America, and so on, that are more illuminated, right? So even this notion of visibility and invisibility that's part of these discussions of the internet as it speaks right now are highly culturally loaded, they're politically loaded, and they speak to particular values. Um, that are being circulated right now. So what is actually happening? That's the question for me. Now we know many people around the world actually have access to these technologies, right? But we know that that access is highly unequal 
And we know that that, form, that axis is not actually a one-size-fits-all type of way of describing the world. In fact, what I'm finding in my research is that even though many people are using these tools, access is a very problematic concept. What's actually happening is people are building their own local networks, as they always have, right? So this is what Ravi Sundaram calls gray zones, right? So what are we talking about here? People taking these tools and reimagining these tools according to their own visions, according to their own communities, according to their own ways of understanding the world. They are not using cell phones so they can speak to the cloud. They're using cell phones perhaps to hunt crocodiles at night. And this is a story that I saw firsthand when I was in Papua New Guinea. Working with a group of crocodile hunters, at night I saw them hunt crocodiles using the lights from their mobile phones. So hunting crocodiles at night, that's a local use of a technology that perhaps defies any of the elements that we often presume around technology access, right? So these are phones that don't have any connectivity, and there's no credit on these phones either, right? So those standard uses of the telephone, or perhaps those prescribed uses of the telephone, are being defied by local context and local community. So there's another story to be told about the globalization of technology. One where globalization is neither you know, simply the kind of unequal forms of labor that we see in the call center case, but it's not also this sort of everybody is equal, everybody participates, this utopic dream of technology either. There is a community-centric DIY, do-it-yourself kind of way of looking at technology in context, in the context of communities and peoples and values and practices that actually tells us a different story. It tells us about how these master models of networks and access are actually broken down into people's own lives, people's own communities. So what we're actually seeing is this sort of master model actually being completely fragmented, completely disrupted. And I believe that that is a core story as we think about the global internet or global media studies. We have to disrupt our notions of the unification, disrupt our notions of accumulation, disrupt our notions of the utopic construction of technology, and think about and respect people and communities and diverse practices, what they stand for, what they believe in. Because that is always what's lost in these Faustian transactions, right? in these transactions that sort of universalize what technology is. We lose sight of people, and we lose sight of humanism. And that's really where my work starts to interject itself. Now, many people would say, oh, well, the Amish are not technological. They defy, they, they, they avoid technology in some ways. And many tribal peoples or indigenous peoples or local communities, developing world communities, are anti-technology. That's a very mistaken understanding of what we think technology actually is. And actually what's happening here, as Faye Ginsburg here at NYU has argued, is what occurs is a type of what she calls a strategic traditionalism. So what does that mean? The Amish have certain technologies that they use in their lives, right? They use certain technologies. They choose consciously and strategically what technologies they want to engage with in what way, right? But that's a conscious choice that's made on the level of a community rather than sort of a presumption of all people accessing the same technologies in the same ways, right? So that is actually that model, again, of breaking down and disrupting and fragmenting our universal understanding of technology that this work is so much about. Another example of what I would argue is an indigenous technology or a community-based technology is this. Luckily, I didn't give the answer to this question on the slide. <laughs> but what do we have here? And you can't say. <laughs> So what is this, and where is it from? Now you know everything. So it's a, it's a, it's a bark painting from Australia. Northern. Northern Australia, specifically. That's right. It's a, it's a Yonggu, who are an Aboriginal community from the Northern Territory, in Arnhem Land specifically. Um, it's an Aboriginal, but it's not simply a painting. It's actually an Aboriginal map. But it's, so a map is a technology, but it's not a technology that we can simply deconstruct according to, our, according to a one-size-fits-all model of understanding mapping. This cannot be deconstructed simply according to the logic of longitude and latitude. This instead is part of a songline, 
a way in which a community, an Aboriginal community in this case, actually understands and remembers and sings its world into being. So this cannot be seen as an abstraction, but it is seen as part of the process of knowing one's land, if that makes any sense. This is a performative practice, right? And we are in performance studies, so I can say this. Um, peoples, uh, the Aboriginal peoples, the Yongu peoples, actually walk their land and they talk while they walk in their land. They remember and they sing and they know places in their land. And those sorts of experiences are, are not necessarily in a literal sense or in a longitudinal sense represented here, but they are memorialized. They are commemorated through these forms of depiction. Right? So the notion of mapping as an indigenous technology actually in this particular case defies many of the binary constructions that are part of the history of science the history of Western science, that is, post-enlightenment thinking. So that's one example here, right? My point being that the notion of technology is not only something that is strategically traditional in the context of digital technology, but it's actually reconstructed. We reconstruct peoples, reconstruct technologies based on their own image, their own understandings of the world, which is culture. Another example of this is the Kibu proverb string. This is an Incan uh, proverb string where peoples from the Incan Empire would literally run string between different parts of their empire. And based on who ran the string and how this, you know, the, the very material of the string, how thick it was, what material it was made out of, um, the contours of the string, many other facets, different messages were encoded. I think of this as an early example of an HTTP network and a MySQL database, right? <laughs> because there's a network here, right? Because people are, are, are actually running information across their empire. But there's also a database because based on the materiality of the string, different accounts were being stored. So this is, of course, Incan and very like pre-digital, but in many ways gives us alternative imaginaries, alternative imaginings of what technology may look like or what technology actually means. Um, so to give you an example of this, um, I'm going to take you to this slide right here. So what am I talking about here? I am actually have tried to disrupt our notion of a kind of unified internet. I have disrupted our notion of the internet access being sort of a one size fits all model. And what I have actually tried to do is reimagine technology in the context of local communities, community life through this work. So what I think is actually happening here is what I call an ontological move, an ontological turn. The term ontology is a widely used term. It's a term used in different ways by peoples from different disciplines. Um, but generally speaking, the way I use this term is about how we talk about what we know. How do we know what we know? How do we articulate that which we know? Right? That's an ontological statement. So I believe the notion of knowledge, how we construct and present and create and model and think about knowledge is itself deeply cultural. And that is represented in the examples I've tried to provide, whether it's the Aboriginal Mac, map or the um, Aboriginal Mac or the uh, Kibu or the Kibu proverb string here, right? So of course we know that ontologies, in a way, are encoded or represented in the languages we speak, right? Fifty-six different words for snow in one Inuit language, right? A Canadian Inuit language. So what does that speak to? That speaks to a deeper subtlety around the concept of snow. Snow is no longer a monolithic concept. It's something that's highly differentiated because these peoples have such a deep exposure to snow in its multiple forms, multiple facets, right? So that is ontological, right? So it's ontological in the sense that different communities speak about and know the world in different ways. And this is represented in the languages we speak. At least so is uh, hypothesized by Sapir and Worf. Right? the Worfian hypothesis. But I believe that this can be a mechanism by which we can revisit the very languages of technology that we take for granted. I mean digital computational um, technology that we take for granted. Uh, databases, algorithms, interfaces. These all represent points of departure for those of us interested in design, those of us who are engineers, those of us who are interested in activist work that kind of empowers communities not through our work, but through the collaboration, through praxis, right? Through that notion of action research. But these all represent points of reimagining. These all represent points where we can rethink the very cultural codes of new media, which is the title of one of my, one of my, um, 
written pieces. So to give you an example of that, I start with my time um, with um, uh, a group of Native American communities that I was invited to work with by um, certain leaders across these reservations. This is in San Diego County uh, in the United States, um, east of San Diego. Some of their land is where Mitt Romney's mansion currently is. Um, it's a pretty strange thing to sort of experience a group of tribal youth going onto the beach in La Jolla and doing their traditional ceremonial rituals while, with uh, Mitt Romney's house as a backdrop. But uh, <laughs> that's the world in which we live. But this world also involves meeting people like Jane Dumas. Jane is a medicine woman. Um, I was invited by the leaders of these communities to take advantage of the fact that they had um, 19 Native American reservations had some sort of wireless internet access that was created as an infrastructure by the state government in partnership with various technology companies. And I was interested in thinking about what does that mean, this sort of internet access? How can that be reimagined according to ontologies of local communities? How could that be reimagined in such a way so as to support the local, to support peoples, to support the strategically traditional? And so I came to Jane. She was the one person across the 19 tribes, as I started to spend time back when I was a graduate student, um, she was one person who everybody told me, almost everybody I met, she was a human network. You need to speak to Jane. Jane is a point of connection across our communities. We often think that technologies come in and there are not, there's nothing that exists. They come in and they sort of solve all our problems, right? Um, instead, the idea here is that technologies, like all tools, work with people and their communities and that which already exists, their own infrastructures that already exist. So Jane is an example of this, right? She's not an infrastructure, but she was a point of mediation, a point of connection across 19 reservations that had been disrupted because of history and genocide and colonialism and so on. And as I came to Jane, I, I asked Jane, how can I work with you to try to support taking advantage of this access to create something with and for your communities. So we prayed in the four directions. I brought her some sage and some tobacco. And it was really interesting for me to kind of see her, her vision of what technology was. I mean, she told me that technology simply don't magically change our communities. Instead, we need to work with that which exists. And she represented a bridge between the different reservations in this way. She said that we need to reimagine technology in the vision of our own communities. So what am I talking about here? Um, these are the Kumeyaay people, Lucenio, Cupeño, and Cahuilla. And this is, of course, their traditional land, pre-contact, so to speak. Um, we know the story. Um, with the establishment of the, um, of the uh, Spanish uh, missions, the Mexican ra uh, rancheros, and the United States reservation system, these communities were disrupted. They were, as they call it, pushed into the rocks because there are desert mountains just quickly as you go east from the, uh, from the coast. Um, and that actually disrupted in many significant ways these people's traditional practices, which were based on seafaring and agrarian agricultural planting. So this is a fragmented sort of reservation system that exists today. And here's a, a GIS map that I generated of this. And fragmentation doesn't exist simply because people are distant from one another, but because the infrastructure that is part of community life is actually no longer serving these people. So people, as I saw in my work, uh, were really disconnected from one another. They were disconnected from traditions. They were disconnected from common cultural threads. And some would say this is associated with a lot of elements that were um, of uh, alcoholism, um, of issues around lack of, tr you know, kind of tr lack of threads of community that were really kind of coming into these people's land. So I was interested in working with Jane to reimagine this. What could a network be that was not created by me, that was not created by Hewlett Packard, but was created by these communities themselves? How could we think ontologically about this question? So what we did is across the 19 reservations, we started to create and share stories with one another. Right? People had access to various technologies as part of this grant, like video cameras, um, just simple recording devices. And they would just tell stories using these, not just folkloric stories, but stories about their community, stories about their land, stories about problems that they had, um, stories about educational goals that they had, stories where they basically criticized one another, right? <laughs> Lots of consent, you know, building of connection and dissension was part of this process. And what did we try to do here? Well, people across these communities, I tried to recruit as many people as I could 
um, over a two-year process, came together and we would kind of collectively reflect on who these people were. Not me, they would. Uh, and I would try to facilitate that process, right? And so people started to create this as an ontology. This was sort of an indigenous created mapping that people created in this community across these 19 reservations of priorities, topics, concepts, categories, themes, visions, imaginaries that were all part of how they wanted to rethink technology. And what did we actually do? Well, this became the way in which we built the entire databases of the system. So we rebuilt the database architecture of this system, which didn't exist. We built a database architecture for this system based on this very ontology, based on this mapping. Um, and that was important because even though this doesn't, is not the same as an Aboriginal song line or an Incan Kibu proverb string, and it is hierarchical in some ways, but, that, but this actually was, some, this was a possibility to, um, to allow commu these communities to take control over the very codes of their technology, the very databases of their technology. And so this was a system we ended up designing together called Tribal Peace, um, preserving education and cultural expression. Um, this was a term that they came up with. And it was based on metaphors um, and interface metaphors that were really important for this community. Uh, people together decided that the manzanita tree, which is um, a symbol of rebirth in these communities, was an important kind of metaphor to build the project around. So this is a very poor example of user interface design from a human computer interaction course that you might take, and I've taken these classes. Um, but it's meaningful because it's articulated by people in this community, and it's built around metaphors that are meaningful to them and around the ontologies, these database architectures that was meaningful for them. So this, you know, there's a lot more to say about this, but most powerfully, um, this became a system that was institutionalized in local schools and local health offices. So people would actually learn, native peoples in these communities would actually learn about their own history and traditions by reading books that were authored in England about them, which was shocking to me. They were now starting to use this system as a way to kind of, in a living way, um, in a dynamic way, kind of engage with people who had stories to tell about their community. And Jane, who is an elderly woman, was not a first order user of this technology or a database designer, but she became someone who became, who, who became a storyteller. And her stories started to circulate locally, right? This wasn't the cloud that we were f fueling here. These were local networks. The system that we built lives on the servers in these communities um, and involved getting some grants to fund this work. But the point is, technologies in these cases were reimagined as a local network according to these particular types of um, interventions that were part of our work. So this is a first project. I intend on telling you about two other projects and then kind of having a conversation with you all about what this all means. Okay. The second um, is a project that's called Amidolane. Amidolane is um, a Zuni term for rainbow. Okay, another metaphor that's meaningful for the Zuni. So the Zuni are a Native American people's uh, community that um, ancestrally can be linked to the Grand Canyon area in Arizona. Um, but currently, um, their land, which has been you know, um, dramatically and disastrously um, um, curtailed and, and uh, cut, cut down, is now uh, in the state of New Mexico and close to the Arizona border, um, near Gallup, New Mexico. Uh, so the Zuni Pueblo is about 40 miles from Gallup, 45 minutes away. Um, and we were thinking, um, I got invited, after doing this Native American work with the Kumeyaay, the earlier project I described, um, I was interested in thinking about how could we actually take these models and actually rethink the very institutions that exist in our world that try to present culture. But they often present culture according to static, objectified, largely ethnocentric um, mechanisms of classifying and documenting and objectifying and freezing culture. So I'm talking about museums and archives, uh, various what we call information institutions. And I was really interested in thinking about that and thinking about whether this model of kind of grassroots based intervention can actually allow us to radically rethink technology and museums in the context of local communities. So luckily, I found at Zuni, through some friends, I was introduced to the leaders of a tribal museum that existed at Zuni. This museum is called the Ashiwi Awan uh, Museum and Heritage Center. And what's actually happening here um, is 
a number of the Zuni leaders from the museum, including um, spiritual leaders from the community, are actually examining another example of a Zuni technology, an indigenous technology. This is another map. But this map is actually being drawn and engraved onto the hide of an elk, right? an elk skin map. But where are they doing this? They are actually visiting a museum, this case in Santa Fe, New Mexico, that has objects of Zuni patrimony. And the way in which they're engaging with this, this map is actually much more material, right? You can see the materiality here. They're actually examining it in a tactile way. They're looking at it for details. Because this form of Zuni knowledge is not, cannot be statically or simplistically classified according to the Western, or the, I may call it the museum's ontology of description, but it's actually part of a performative practice by which people um, know the world. And what's interesting here is that none of these individuals can tell you what this map is. They can only collectively construct that understanding of what the map is. It's a collective process by which knowledge is created, shared, and passed on, which itself is dynamic and evolving at Zuni. So what's actually happening here is an example of the Zuni ontology, the Zuni production of knowledge. And this, to me, represented a very interesting possibility in, conver in conversations with these leaders from the museum by which we can reimagine how technology might be able to support Zuni practices of thinking about culture, Zuni practices of thinking about museums and history. So we were really interested in these questions. And this is particularly because Zuni objects, objects from these communities, are totally misrepresented um, in museums and archives that exist all over the world. And this image is meant to show the differences between how a museum catalog represents pieces from Zuni that have been sitting in you know, museums all over the world, including in Japan. There are, mu there are museums in Japan with Zuni objects. Um, on the right-hand side, we see you know, um, descriptions um, of these Zuni objects according to terms like Clark LCG, who's the archaeologist that dug up this stuff and got it out of there into art collectors' hands, or ZX2472. <laughs> you know, an ID number. So it's become a specimen. The object has moved from being part of the cultural process of sharing and creating knowledge to the scientific specimen. And on the left-hand side, we see what the Zuni have told us about these objects. So significant deviation, right? People at Zuni see these objects in the context of stories that they tell um, in terms of what we call practices, the things people do. These objects are not divorced from context. They are part of context. They are part of the lived experience at Zuni. And that tends to be obliterated from the ways museums describe these objects. That's because these are different ontologies, yet again. Right? So the way museums and archaeologists, uh, curators and archaeologists, see the world is based on their own specialized knowledge by which they approach these objects, right? So archaeologists have their own language for describing such objects. Museum curators are interested in broader categories to describe these objects. But for the Zuni, it's all about the local. It's all about the story. It's all about that process of performance. And those are multiple ontologies. Those are different ways of talking about the world that are at this point that James Clifford has described as a contact zone uh, based on Mary Louise Pratt's work. So this is a very interesting point for us. Um, based on my invitation by the leaders of the Zuni Museum, is there a way in which we can rethink technology to support Zuni practices of sharing and knowing? And how does that change a historically unequal relationship with museums? So this is an example of a system that we designed together. It's pretty simple, right? Um, it's called Amidolane, like I described. And all it does is it privileges, it gets objects. So now we have um, now eight museums all over the world that are part of our project, um, each contributing several hundred of their items that they're digitizing. And folks at Zuni are actually, cre uh, we have created a system with them where they can simply look at the objects that are coming to them from these museums. It is not the same as getting these objects back. It's not repatriation at all. It's simply creating an opportunity for folks at Zuni to see what of theirs has been wrongfully taken and do what they want with it. Again, strategic traditionalism, right? Do what they want with it. And so what we see happening here is people are seeing objects of their own patrimony, and they're choosing to share knowledge with one another, perhaps larger groups of people within the tribe, and only occasionally with the museums. 
And it's also helping them develop a strategy by which they can decide what they want to physically repatriate using uh, NAGPRA legislation. So this is a very simple system where people can look at 800 objects now from the eight museums, 100 objects per museum. Um, that the Zuni themselves have selected. They want the images around. There's some very thorny political issues here, like human remains that um, museums have images of, um, which is um, extremely offensive for many people at Zuni, and they don't want to look at that. But what we see powerfully happen happening is the collective ways, just like the, um, the elk skin hide, the collective ways in which people in this community are approaching this technology that we've designed together. Now, there's only one system up there, but there's you know, about 10 people in the room. Who these people are represent different medicine clans and different kind of elements of the community. And they have to collectively look at the digital object, the image of the object. As they collectively ex experience that object, they tell stories with one another. And what I noticed in this very moment while I was watching them use this thing that we designed together was how certain people at certain times in the discussion would put their fingers in their ears. And I was like wondering why is that happening? And that's because the Zuni production of knowledge is based on who should know what between that boundary between what's sacred and what's transparent. Right? That is the way in which these sort of cultural practices are formed and sustained. So certain youth would put their fingers in their ears because they were not yet um, initiated within a particular medicine clan where they could learn certain things. Certain teachers would actually put their fingers in their ears when, con when knowledge was being shared that they were not allowed to yet teach to the youth. Right? So on a, from a very like, Western paradigmatic like, liberal level, this seems really like, problematic, right? Be, and, and this is very much the, the model that we speak about when we talk about the cloud, right? Like everything should be open. You know, we love open source, right? Everything should be um, generated by our equal access to technology or equal providing of information. It's a kind of everybody is sharing with one another. It's what Lawrence Lessig calls a read-write culture, right? But that epistemologically doesn't really fit with the practices of this community. So what you're actually doing is as you export a particular model of understanding and thinking about technology, you're actually just completely um, <laughs> uh, eradicating and, uh, and totally ignoring that which is culture. right? And that's really problematic and a real concern for us. So again, this represents but a simple attempt for us to kind of rethink technology in the context of a particular local community. And in so doing, kind of rethink what networks are and rethink how peoples can reclaim technology to support their own priorities, their own values, their own very oral and performative processes of engaging with information. Because if we don't do that, we have this. So I searched for Zuni pottery, and um, the first re retrieval I had was from eBay, right? So what, so what does that mean ontologically, right? That means Zuni pottery is commodity. It's an exchangeable commodity, right? That is very different ontologically speaking than the ways folks from, not, not just even in a disrespectful sense, but just as a claim of what that knowledge is, right? A claim of what pottery is. Um, that's very different than the ways in which folks at Zuni would experience or talk about that piece of pottery. Perhaps they might choose to sell it, but they certainly wouldn't choose to sell it according to this sort of protocol, right? So again, pottery as part of a grandmother's birthing ritual is very different than pottery as transactional commodity in eBay, right? And these other sites, which is really interesting to me, um, like Keshi, Zuni Pottery, might seem like, oh, it's a little bit more localized. It's more built around Zuni language and so on. But this actually happens to be a very elite art collector's website uh, in Santa Fe, right? So again, in this case, we've moved away from object as commodity to object as you know, kind of fetish capital, right? So again, a different ontological lens by which we think about things. And so this actually brings up the, the killer point here, which is how do we think about the ontologies of search? How do we think about the ontologies of how we classify and order the world you know, in a very like, Foucauldian way, right? You know, how do we make those sort of choices of um, how we choose to say that which we know, or articulate that which we know, or structure the world in particular ways. And what's problematic by exporting such algorithms far and wide without respecting the vernaculars of particular peoples and cultures. 
So, you know, both these projects represent my sort of simple attempts to try to work with communities. Um, these are multiple year projects. Uh, think about technology in local ways and support that which is already happening in these communities. But I was really interested in kind of thinking about that more broadly and um, thinking about this on a level that kind of is really geopolitical and kind of like, and, and really, um, in a way, really like shaking our foundations of how we understand people and social change and politics in line with the Hemispheric Institute's interests in these things. So that brings me to the final piece that I want to share today, which is really looking at kind of the strategically traditional ways in which technology is being reimagined in the context of an ongoing uprising and revolution in Egypt. So this is a third case that I've been working on for the past three years, primarily in the summers. So I was interested, of course, in disrupting this particular model, right? This is a shirt that you can buy in, um, in Tahrir Square. And it's sort of, these are actually not the actual logos uh, in every case of these companies. But this shirt sort of conveys a particular message, which is that these tools are tools of revolution, right? That is the, that, that something is um, natural, something is, um, is truly there about these particular technologies that makes revolution possible. And I was very concerned with that, right? Not simply because I'm like a whatever, um, you know, armchair skeptic, <laughs> but because I knew at the time of the uprisings in uh, January and February of 2011, the first 18 days of protest um, after Tunisia and in Egypt, that there was under 5% uh, Facebook access in Cairo and under 1% Twitter access. And obviously, as we could guess, those people tend to be demographically homogenous, similar to one another, right? You know, upper middle class, more liberal, younger, technologically literate in these particular modalities, and so on. So that, so that kind of disrupted one understanding of what this might be. But generally, everything about this talk has been a, about moving us away from a tool-driven understanding, a technology, a, techno, a technocratic-driven understanding of what these tools could mean or should mean. So it's much more interesting, much more fun, and much more respectful to look at these things in the context of people's practices, places, and environments. So when you do that, and you actually get into the middle of different protests, which was something I was doing back in 2011, you see various geographies in protests themselves. You see the people that are active on Twitter during a particular protest moment on the top right, and you see the people in the front lines. And these two groups are very distinct and very demographically different from one another. Their grievances are very different from one another. Partly, it's because these guys are on their phones, not on the front lines of a protest, because it's very difficult to be on your phone and tweet a revolution while you're having you know, tear gas shot at you, right? or rubber bullets shot at you. But these guys on the front lines are all about that. They're all about the bodily, right? Like putting their bodies in this particular space of confrontation. And their grievances and their reasons for being there and the ways they articulate that which they care about are very different from one another. Much more about economic grievances on the bottom right. The price of food, the price of oil, so on and so forth. Which can be easily manipulated by the military regime and is currently being manipulated. And these guys on the top right are much more talking about like global journalism, human rights, democracy, so on and so forth. So there's a disconnect because there are multiple publics that are part of every protest movement. And this is a challenge for activists to try to think about how to reconcile and work through those different publics. Because otherwise we get this, right? And we've all had this experience, I believe. I certainly have. Where you know we think we're talking to somebody else outside of our own bubble. We're talking to ourselves. We're talking to ourselves. We're talking to ourselves. That kind of infinitely regressive process of what um, some people call an echo chamber, the experience of that sort of what's also called slacktivism. You know, you're kind of like passing on petitions, and you feel like that's making some sort of change, like change.org. But then you kind of feel like, how does that actually translate? But at the same time, it's important not to simply dismiss this out of hand, because there are particular people that are using these tools. And perhaps if we look contextually, we can actually see productive uses of these tools, again, according to these strategically traditional ways, that are making a difference. 
And here's one example of that, right? That's quite obvious. At many protests, you'll see people holding their mobile phones up. Maybe they aren't the people on Twitter, but remember, many more people have mobile phones, and a lot of mobile phones have the capacity to simply like take photos or even really crappy, simple video. Um, so you see that, right? And often, that which starts with a mobile phone kind of video capture can globalize. It doesn't always, though, right? So Mohamed Boazizi, street vendor from Tunisia, kind of seen, he, he sets himself on fire. He's sort of seen as the father of the Arab Spring, right? perhaps the first moment of the Arab Spring. Um, you know, few hundred people around, a number of people with mobile phones capturing this content. Millions of people see this content on various video sharing platforms, including YouTube, within one day. And then it becomes the lead story on various sort of mainstream networks around the world. So this, again, sort of newer media technologies are shaping the agenda of some of the older media technologies in this case. But always in these stories, certain parts of the story are filtered out, right? Like Mohammed Boazizi was part of a labor movement. That part was not really told. He was just seen as every man's man. Or that there's a long history in the Arab world, and specifically Tunisia, of people setting themselves on fire. Right? So what is it about these particular moments that make them activate? That's an extremely interesting question for me. And perhaps this is very interesting because in parts of the world, like even central Cairo, many people actually have access to satellite television because of the liberalization of the television spectrum that was part of what Mubarak and other, other you know, dictators in that part of the world did at that time, so in the early 1990s. So that's interesting to me because that which starts through sort of newer media platforms can often get onto older media platforms through an example such as this, a shack in Islamic Cairo that I visited where there was only one pl electricity plug point right here on the left that was powering a satellite TV dish that was powering a television that had a reporter on TV that I had interviewed the previous day who tells me because of the 24-hour news cycle, he gets his stories using Twitter. So again, there is a chain of mediation that's happening here, but at every single part of the chain, there's misrepresentation, there's filtration of stories, there's false positives. So what we are having here is a network of different technologies that are informing one another that are also based on misinformation. So that's part of the story here as well. So many activists have told me now, in my third year of working in Egypt, that you know, perhaps they were seduced by the story that was told to them about themselves, right? That they were, you know, because of their use of these tools, they've really achieved great success. And they realized very quickly how various institutions and political forces in the country rapidly co-opted what was kind of a more um, decentralized, rhizomatic, kind of anarchistic type of movement, right? Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, namely, and most importantly, the uh, military regime that's remained in charge, right? And the military regime can dramatically manipulate the kind of guys that I showed who are in the front lines of these protests because they can artificially change prices in the country because they're all billionaires, right? So that's part of the sort of neoliberal regime in process. So many activists are kind of dismayed about this, but they have found a few ways of trying to work out of these bubbles, work out of these echo chambers. So I'm going to give you just a couple examples of this, and then we can wrap this up and have a discussion about this. The first is this. This is an image of a, um, of a um, meeting that I attended in 2012. Uh, Allah Abdel Fateh, who is a very famous um, blogger and activist, who's been in solitary confinement, was on Democracy Now! recently, is standing there in the middle of the room. I'm taking this photo over here. You know, I'm an, I'm an outsider here, but I'm so interested in what's going on over there and trying to learn about this and share these stories. Um, and what I think is interesting here is there's three different publics, three different communities that are all interwoven in this particular moment, right? What's going on here on the back? Live Twitter feed, but the people participating in this conversation on Twitter are not simply in the room. They're all over the world, right? So there are particular people that are being targeted, namely media journalists in particular parts of the world, who they are trying to take this and translate their stories to, right? So it's not about how many people follow you on Twitter, it's who follows you on Twitter. And can those people tap into networks where they can get more access to their content? 
So that's one thing, right? So this is a group of activists. These are very much the social media users that I've been talking about. This is a sort of global public that they're trying to reach in a particular way. But what they're talking about is based on a vox pop model. They are simply coming in here, and each of these people are charged with trying to gather stories from other communities outside of themselves, right? So there is an invisibility to that, but at least this, the, the, the realities and the grievances of people outside of their own category are part of this discussion. So what I find interesting here is how three different publics are being merged into one moment, right? This is a very smart strategic move I think activists have taken to try to like build coalitions across people who are not just like themselves. And it's through misinformation and a little bit of manipulation and a hustle that's part of the deal here. A second model um, that uh, the media activist collective Mosarin has been engaging with is called um, the Kaze Boom campaign. And what does that mean? They're basically taking content that they were able to gather online and they're projecting it into public spaces, right? And they're projecting it in a way that's gone completely viral, meaning they're simply distributing video cameras and simple low cost projectors all over the country and asking people to film the abuses of the regime. Not in Cairo, but in their own neighborhood and project it in their own neighborhood. So this is a radically decentralized model, right? Because they don't even know, the activists that are my friends here, they don't even know how many actions like this are happening all over the country. And what they're doing is they're changing the perception slowly of, on a very local way, of what people think about the institutions and those that are in power around them. Because it's much more convincing to see content that's curated, that's created and distributed by your neighbor in, if you're in a remote village in the Sinai than some you know, bougie activist um, sitting in Cairo from the American University in Cairo, right? That is much more convincing. It's much more legitimate. That's much more integral for people. So this is a viral radical model that many activists are trying to engage with. If you notice, there's no internet here, right? I mean, there is the content. But there's no longer any internet. But in many ways, it resembles a particular architecture by which we thought about the internet as a decentralized set of networks. And a final example of this is um, the campaign that was the Tamarod campaign, the, re the rebel campaign. And this is something that I observed um, while things were going completely crazy around me last summer when I was in Egypt. Um, 35 million people, apparently, though there's lots of disputes about this, signed this pledge, which simply said uh, President Morsi, Mohammed Morsi, who was the head of the Muslim Brotherhood um, at the time, should leave office, right? And what's interesting about this? Well, what happened here? Twitter produced leafleting. <laughs> um, newer media produced older media in this particular case, right? This started as an online campaign, and then they quickly realized, these activists, by their own seduction, they sort of realized not that many people are online. Not that many people are going to have access to us. We should just make photocopies of all of this and just send them to, just, just leave them on the street. Anybody who gets any single piece of this paper can make as many copies of this themselves. And we'll just gather this. And this will be our impetus to act, 35 million people. The sad part of all of this, which I already alluded to, is how rapidly these decentralized movements can be co-opted. And they've been particularly co-opted by the institution of the military. So um, I left just two days before this, but I was really concerned about this when I realized this was happening. Um, through this sort of model, multiple, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people were on the streets in Cairo and around the country June 30th, 2013, right? Two days after the protests start, helicopters start flying above these people in the square, in Tahrir, but also in front of the Tahadea, the presidential palace. And they're dropping Egyptian flags you know, to people. We are in solidarity with your protest movement. And people cheer. They're so excited. They're so happy. And that's the, that's the issue that we have here, that tension between the sort of networked form of activism and how institutions can co-opt those networks. So this is a wide range of different projects, but they're all based on the disruption of the cloud, the disruption of the organismic, you know, world brain kind of idea of thinking about technology. Um, and I think actually this isn't even necessarily like a utopic model I'm trying to spin here. I'm basically saying that this is what's happening. What's happening in the world 
uh, which is good news in my opinion, um, is people are taking hold of the tools that are around them because they don't even see those tools as one and the same based on who they are, where they are, and what they care about, right? And that is something that I think is really important for us to pay attention to uh, insofar as we try to respect um, principles of social justice and diversity and equality in our world today. So I want to have a conversation about this. Uh, thank you all. Thank you. you were thinking when you, when you put up the slide about the echo chamber. I, I don't know if anybody else was, because before you commented about that, I just immediately thought you were talking about cable news. <laughs> before, before you even commented about it's the similar, picture, right? I thought the picture was about cable news. Right. Um, yeah, I think, you know, my, you know, we have this particular, um, like, way of understanding new technology, this kind of idea that circulates that, oh, we use new te technology to get out of the gatekeeping model that was like traditionally part of broadcast media, right? Mm -hmm. So like cable news specifically, right? I mean, it's so frustrating, the, na the nature of soundbite culture and the ways in which mm -hmm. stories are being filtered in particular ways. Um, but our, you know, our experiences on these social media platforms are highly filtered, right? The filters are created first by ourselves, right? We tend to follow people Maybe not always, but we tend to follow people or friend people on Facebook or on Twitter, respectively, who are somewhat similar to us. But also, those systems themselves have various filtration algorithms built into them, um, what Eli uh, Pariser calls the filter bubble, that actually um, are based on their own notions, their own ontologies of what is relevant or not to you. So my point was that there is a sort of mistaken assumption that our uses of new technology sort of somehow, in and of themselves, take us out of that sort of echo chamber of cable news or of broadcast media. But actually, in many cases, that's what ends up happening. And that was something I observed um, in action in Egypt. So yeah, please follow up if you have other questions. Yeah, thanks. Uh, sure, I just, sorry, I just wanted to yeah. maybe to clarify something. Yeah. Um, so is it, uh, you, were, you were talking at some point of the, the fact that uh, different technologies were informing each other and they were misinforming each other? Yes. But, um, and then you gave the example of the activist group whose name I can't remember. Mosaddin. The yeah. projectors. Yeah. And, yes. Yeah. And isn't that an example of like, potential misrepresentation? Absolutely. And that's a great point. I, I actually forgot to say that. Um, activists are realizing that their whole game is also misinformation, right? And spinning your stories in particular ways to particular audiences, you know, which is not necessarily like uniquely like duplicitous, but it's what we all do, right? Um, you know, I, I didn't have time to show this slide today, but um, I observed a um, 18,000 person sit in in a factory in a place called Mahalla, which is where the labor movement kind of dates back in Egypt, dating over 10 years back there. And, um, you know, 18,000 striking laborers during Ramadan, um, tending to be 35 and over, mostly in their mid-40s and, um, and older, and one 21-year-old boy in the room, right? And, and uh, that 21-year-old that boy was, definitely looked different than everybody else. He had a video camera, and I was like, what are you doing here? And I, um, I talked to him in the next room, and he says, well, I'm trying to blog about what's going on here, and I want to tie this to the Revolutionary Socialist Party cause. And I was asking these laborers who were on strike, you know, what's your connection to the, what do you think about the Revolutionary Socialists? Do you want um, the Morsi regime to be, to, to, you know, to be dissolved? I mean, th there was no awareness either of the Revolutionary Socialists or any desire to kind of take down the government, right? There was a simple sort of, again, this idea of grievances based on who you are, right? The grievances were for just better pay, better benefits, these types of things. But this was being capitalized upon, right, through processes of misinformation, or perhaps it's framing to build their networks, right? So do you think there's, um, there's, still, sorry, there's still a difference between um, misinformation on a global scale or on a local scale? Or does that well, mm -hmm. influence somehow the, the nature of the misinformation? Yeah, I mean, I think what I'm trying to describe are um, 
on the local scale, the multiple ways um, everybody across the political map is engaging in misinformation, right? Like dropping the Egyptian flags is a, is a technique of misinformation, right? Um, you know, planting, and this is another thing that's been happening a lot in Egypt, um, double agents, right? So people from particular um, political affiliations are, are pr pretending to be parts of their opposition and then planting lots of false information on those particular pages or by uh, posing as double agents in these ways. So misinformation is definitely the name of the game. I think on the level of um, misinformation in terms of like global news, um, I think that has a lot to do with the nature of journalism, how we choose what stories we engage with, um, how we choose to frame particular stories. Um, so the 24-hour news cycle has created this need for people to constantly have to create new material and new stories. Um, but that is often based on a model of trusting a Twitter source who might be really popular in your own Twitter network but might not even live in Egypt. And I've seen that happen as well. So, yeah. Thank you so much for the terrific talk. Thank um, you. My name is Sabra Thunder, and I'm a professor of museum studies here. And I'm also okay. a, um, a student, our former student of Bacon. For okay. Like full disclosure. Um, and I've also Wonderful. done field work with Ami Urtica in Australia, which Aha. is the National Archive at India. Right. Um, so John something, John right? Dalwitz. John yeah. Dalwitz. And, and I've followed your work for a really long time. So again, like oh, in the interest you. of full disclosure, which is where my comment is coming from. And I think this is more of a comment than a question, but cool. perhaps it'll evoke something. Um, I just really appreciate your work that you're doing to disrupt the neutralization of these metaphors that we're using. And I find myself yeah. doing that in my own work yeah. now as I'm back in the field and trying to write. Um, and especially the cloud. I hadn't thought about the cloud in particular, though yeah. I think a lot about networks and interfaces and bridges and how we use these yeah. metaphors and make them neutral in our own work. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the things that strikes me from your three examples is that, and it goes back to a kind of an offhanded comment that you made about Mitt Romney's house, which is that we, these are all in the world that we live in, right? All three of these examples, yeah. the indigenous California example, the Zuni example, and the Egypt social media examples, right. were all in the same world. And I'm, I'm finding myself, and I promise I'm getting to the point, um, just that thinking about, for example, in my own work with the digital archive, thinking about how the ways that we talk about, well, indigenous communities, people have differential access to knowledge. Well, that is true, and it's really important to think ethnographically about the particularities yeah. of that situation, but that's also true in our own lives, right? I mean, think about who hasn't felt uncomfortable about yeah. yourself or your image circulating on Facebook, yeah. or the privacy breaches, or the NSA, or the Rupert Murdoch, scam, you know, I mean, all of these things. And I guess, I guess that's what's striking me about your talk is, is that you're sort of enacting mm. that we are all in the same social world, and even though we are all in the same social world, it's still really important to both not neutralize the metaphors and also to think ethnographically about them. Uh, I mean, I think that's just precisely it. And I think there's been a false, um, false dichotomy set up between either the, between the, on the one hand, the lockdown of information and openness on the other. But both of those are actually open, are, are actually spaces of different types of manipulation. Mm -hmm. And both of, none of those are strategically or uh, culturally negotiated, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, it's, you know, like Kim Kristen does similar work to this. I'm sure you know her work. Like, um, you know, sh she sort of makes these arguments of like she calls it Aboriginal remix. But um, <laughs> I mean, basically, she talks about how kind of the locking down of information is sort of defies the sort of you know the TED model, right? Like everything's open, everything should be openly accessible. Um, it's either Snowden or it's the or it's the um, you know the NSA. On the other hand, not you know realizing that some of what Snowden has to say reeks of cyber libertarianism yeah. as much as you know his acts seem very admirable and they are but uh, you know there's that critical unpacking that kind of recognizes how people negotiate knowledge that is part of this and that's a, it's that tension right I mean a lot of people see my work on the Zuni, with the Zuni and say well everybody should have access to that knowledge and you know when I, I you know I'm pretty good friends with these people over time and I sort of mentioned some of these critiques of the project and they say that's not your business <laughs> and they're pretty clear about telling you that, you know? But I think it is, it is harder and harder, I think, to not drink the Kool-Aid yeah. in a way, right? I mean, for the, you know, just like all information wants to be free and right. the, what did you call it, the um, Silicon Valley cyber... Utopian? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it is harder and harder to not drink that 
Cool. Yeah. Like, which makes your disruptions all the more important. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I'm trying to apply them at different levels of scale, but I'm not, I mean, what I'm struggling with is trying to figure out what, like, all of these together mean and how all these together, because how, how do you take, like, the, um, how do you create, like, new assemblages, right? Like that kind of idea. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Maybe on that thing related to that thing, I was really struck with all of the examples, but maybe especially the Zuni one, how, yeah. you know, you're, you're building these networks and repurposing technology and disrupting the way technology is used for the communities, but you look at that search, Zuni pottery, and it's mind-blowing. Um, like yeah. It just, the jarringness of it, and it just puts it all into perspective, and it, it can really help, I think, uh, I mean, that, you know, there's, it, it also, your projects make us more mindful of what we're doing and what we're yeah. part of and what we're, who we're fucking over. Yeah. Um, and maybe... And even who we are, you know, like who, who's the we that is doing that, right? To me, that has a lot to do with the invisibility of these algorithms, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not enough to simply make them transparent, which is like the classic, again, the kind of classic, classic sort of Western, act, Western liberal or Western activist critique. It's actually about allowing spaces for, um, or just not dominating the local, you know, not trivializing the local. That's kind of my main point, you know? Yeah. I, I think though on the, yeah. it's, it's one thing with you, <coughs> sorry, it's one thing if you, um, you know, you develop the technology to wrap cans in plastic and then all this plastic ends up in the Pacific. Um, and that's doing harm to other people. Um, but I think with regard to, you know, technology being connected to culture, well, if, you know, particular people develop a technology, it's, it's presumably they're developing it to, you know, service some issue within their culture. So I don't really find it very, very surprising that they're not intimately aware of how the Zuni people are, are might interact with that technology. Because they're not developing it for the Zuni people. That's they're right. They're developing it for themselves. Yeah. But the other thing about... Yeah, I agree. The other thing about um, whether, all te whether all information should be free. Um, and then there's a difference between freedom to broadcast and freedom to query, right? So, you know, if, I, if, you, if you want to share something, you want a technological mm -hmm. solution that makes it easy to share it, that doesn't necessarily mean that, that you want to share everything. Right. Yeah, yeah that's, I mean, I, I certainly agree with that. And actually, I probably should have done a better job of explaining this. What's happening at Zuni, I need a good, like, visual way of explaining this. What's happening at Zuni is they are deciding, collect, like, as a group, that, that group of people that I showed the picture of, they are looking at these objects. They are, they are often recording their, their reactions and experiences to this, and they switch languages. They code switch, right? Because um, speaking in Zuni allows them to actually have the conversation about these objects. But the, everything they write is written in English because Zuni has never been a written language. So there's all these elements to this, right? But to your point, which is, a, I think, an excellent point, they're actually carefully navigating what is shared with whom. I kind of made that point earlier, but they have a very particular system uh, that they develop to decide whether it's only for people in the room, whether it's only for some people in the room, as evidenced by putting the fingers in the ears, whether it's for you know, particular medicine groups in the community, whether it's for like the community as a whole, which almost nothing is, or whether it's for like public. <laughs> so like the museum curators and the archaeologists that are partners in this project that are actually all only brought to us because the Zuni said these are people we can work with, are called public. They're not given any sort of special special status. So the point I'm trying to make is the broadcasting of information or the circulation of information is built around the protocols of how you choose to share it. Right. So it's very much to your point. 